Hi, I'm Chris Lewecki, Senior Digital Copywriter for DIA, and we're here today with Mr. Nielsen Hopps, who is Executive Editor of the Pink Sheet and Script, who just chaired the DIA Global Annual Meeting Session titled Interchangeable Biosimilars, A Global Perspective. Thank you, first of all, for joining us here today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with the DIA. It's a pleasure to have you here, too. Um, just a bit of background, What's what topics were recently discussed in the session you just chaired? Well, we had a great session with a uh, variety of panelists. We uh, looked at the question of uh, how biosimilars are, are used and paid for and developed across the globe. Uh, we had a, uh, um, a regulator from Norway and uh, we had uh, um, uh, manufacturers from the U.S. looking at sort of kind of what's uh, happening in the different markets. Uh, um, you know, the question in the U.S. on biosimilars is uh, um, how to really uh, boost uptake. The, uh, um, in, uh, in many respects, the U.S. is uh, behind the rest of the world in terms of, sort of, kind of having developed a pathway only recently compared to sort of the, um, the several years uh, prior in, uh, in Europe. And so uh, mm -hmm. one of the big questions was sort of, kind of what lessons from Europe can um, even uh, payers, uh, regulators, and uh, sponsors uh, learn as they move into the U.S. and sort of, kind of how, uh, how to make this, uh, uh, this product class uh, um, as robust as everyone wants it to be. We often hear, especially in the DIA environment, of the need for global regulatory, regulatory harmonization. Uh, are there areas on a global perspective of scientific, I guess would be the word, harmonization that are keeping, that is keeping uptake of these products from becoming more effective in the market? Well, one of the big questions is whether U.S. applications can rely on data from foreign studies. Okay. Um, uh, that's not so much an uptake question as an approval question. Um, obviously, sort of kind of once it gets on the market, sort of the uptake could be driven by use of those studies uh, to, to increase acceptance and sort of kind of, uh, um, you know, reimbursement and those kinds of questions. But uh, um, one of the things that FDA has to decide is whether it's going to allow and to what degree it might allow sort of kind of foreign studies um, to, uh, to be used for, uh, um, for, to support uh, biosimilar applications. Uh, you know, I, this is not in the script. I appreciate you letting me riff. Thank you. Uh, did the ICH uh, E17 or multi-regional clinical trials, does that in any way impact the clinical uh, development of biosimilars? The, the, with biosimilars, the, the standard is um, uh, uh, not so much a, a clinical one, but uh, looking at uh, um, what's called... Uh, I'm now blanking on the term. I'm sorry. The originator. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes. Or the innovator. Excuse right. You have to compare it to the, um, the originator, but it's not. Uh, it's not a bioequivalence uh, um, per se. It's not a, uh, a, a clinical test unless you're looking at interchangeability. It's a. Uh, um, it's a comparability uh, um, okay. question. So uh, yeah. So it's not so much a, uh, a clinical trials issue as sort of as a using a reference product that was approved in a foreign country as opposed to a reference product that was approved in the U.S. that they can sort of do those uh, comparability studies. Uh, okay. um, so uh, I asked the right question, but about the wrong product. Right. <laughs> the E17 applies to the originator, the innovator, right. because right. of That's the nature of those yeah. clinical trials. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, we we. Uh, I'll try to promise that's the last time I deviate from the script. <laughs> um, as we, uh, you know, the ultimate goal is patience and getting patients to take these products so long as they're safe and effective and good for them. The, we have 80 different countries at this annual meeting. Are there cultural differences that you've seen in the uptake of biosimilars or has the uptake of biosimilars, in your opinion, been driven primarily by the pricing benefits that they deliver? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, mostly the, uh, the the mighty dollar, or in this case, the tiny dollar, that sort of kind of uh, drives uh, uh, drives uptake for the most part. If a uh, health system or just sort of a U.S. payer thinks it can save money by uh, um, by switching to a biosimilar, it will. There are um, obviously different. Uh, um, uh, Designs of health systems throughout the uh, uh, throughout the globe. Uh, uh, we had uh, Stenar uh, Madsen of the Norwegian uh, Medicines Institute on our panel, and he was talking about sort of kind of this uh, more collective approach that uh, um, 
Norway has compared to the U.S. in terms of its health system. It's just sort of a single, uh, a single entity, and there, there is sort of a more of a uh, uh, collective purpose that if we all sort of kind of decide to do this, we can sort of all benefit from them. And that was from one of the cases he was, uh, yeah. he was making there. Um, you'll see in the U.S. there's much more of a decision by payers being made and what they're looking at uh, after their patients in terms of sort of kind of more sort of kind of a, a fragmented system. So that's a. Uh, um, it's a different, uh, uh, a different okay. approach. So. This was also not on the list, but it was something I learned in this session. Why is there an interchangeability designation in the United States? That's just how the law was written. There, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, our panelists had a great uh, um, exchange about sort of whether that's sort of kind of a, uh, a benefit or a, a detriment to the uh, um, to the products. On the one hand, it sort of kind of provides an extra level of, uh, of surety that uh, um, that uh, you know patients and uh, providers can uh, um, can use uh, for it. But uh, um, on the other hand, it sort of kind of creates another hurdle that a uh, the sponsor would have to uh, to go through. I think uh, the, uh, the 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 congressional authors of the uh, um, of the program thought it was important to uh, to make that distinction because it's such a new um, uh, category of product, and sort of, kind of this, mm -hmm. this this way, it sort of kind of it allows uh, four different kinds of products to come onto the market in a uh, um, in the fashion in which they're able to. I found out about it an hour ago, in <laughs> fact, so that's how new it is. Um, be before I get to the end, do you see therapeutic areas that you think are ripe for biosimilars? Are there particular disease areas? that you think biosimilars could make a real impact short term? It's, it's really sort of a question for, uh, for sponsors where they see the best uh, market opportunity in terms of uh, um, developing that. What we've seen in the, uh, the market uh, for the most part is the ones that have been uh, approved and uh, used have been mostly sort of kind of on the medical benefit side and uh, we've yet to see sort of one that was sort of going to be substituted in the pharmacy and the question was sort of kind of how that kind of automatic substitution might work would uh, um, is one of the questions we were exploring in the, uh, in the panel and uh, um, one of the great uh, reasons for being at DIA is to sort of uh, hear from all these experts and uh, and learn what they are uh, thinking about and, uh, and doing. So, uh, Before I let you go, would you define that concept of medical benefit? I sure. mean, you would think every drug would be developed for its medical benefit, but it seems to be used a specific way in this specific context. Sure, that's an insurance term mostly. It's sort of kind of that uh, if you think about sort of the, the pharmacy benefit is uh, for products that you uh, go to your uh, local neighborhood uh, drugstore to get through from uh, um, from behind the counter from your uh, your friendly white coated uh, um, technician there. Um, medical benefit is more stuff that is uh, administered in hospitals or by doctors, and it's sort of kind of just sort of paid for by the insurance companies in a different way. And that's sort of kind of uh, what okay. sort of kind of drives the uh, the various decisions in terms of sort of how uh, how it gets reimbursed and sort of, kind of what uh, what product gets used. Okay, thank you, thank you for explaining that. Final question, I promise. Yes, okay. Keep uh, going. Um, so we're all here in Boston, and next week we will all be back at our respective jobs. What do you hope people took from the session we just left that will help them at work next week? Sure. Well, I mean, I think the uh, the idea that there are lots of different levers that can be pulled to to change uptake of biosimilars is an important one. So, kind of what uh, um, decisions can regulators make? What decisions can payers make? What decisions can sponsors make? And you know, if you're a sponsor, or a regulator, or a payer, you, know, you have to think about sort of kind of you know the decisions I make are going to affect what those other two segments you know are able to do and will do for right, me. And so right. sort of kind of if you if you want to limit biosimilars, there are a lot of steps you can take in that direction. If you want to um, increase biosimilars, there are a lot of steps in that direction too. But sort of kind of knowing sort of kind of what the the various steps that you can take are is an important part of being at DIA and learning all these. Uh, these new, uh, these new issues. So I lied, I do have one more. Um, if you could eliminate one popular misconception about biosimilars, sure. what would it be? Uh, Got you. Uh, yes, uh, the, uh, um, I guess I would eliminate the idea that they are, uh, um, they're not real products, that they're, that they're not uh, as uh, uh, carefully vetted uh, by the FDA as, as other FDA approved products. Thank you. Thank you for your flexibility. Anytime. Really appreciate being here at DIA and, uh, and helping with the educational uh, activities. We really hope you've enjoyed this interview with Mr. Hobbs, executive editor of the Pink Sheet and Script on biosimilars and their global applicability. For DIA Insights, I'm Chris Slowecki. Thank you.